And then we're going to look at a passage in Ephesians today that talks about the church, uh, the blessing that the church is, the reason we have church, and sort of the story behind what is this thing called church, how did it come about. And uh, as we look at that, we're going to look at really the heart of the letter of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians is a personal letter. It is a book in our Bible, but it was also written by Paul the Apostle at a particular time to a particular people. Paul was in prison in Rome awaiting trial. He had been for years awaiting trial. And he's writing back to a group of believers in a city far away in Ephesus, some of whom he knew well. He worked with them years earlier. Many have joined the church since that time, and he does not know them, but he's heard about some disagreements, some tensions, some problems. And so he's writing the letter to address those. And the passage we're going to look at today and next week are the very central issue of why he's writing the letter. And it has to do with explaining what church is all about. How did it come about? And what is it? And we're going to look today at sort of the earlier stage. What was salvation like? And what was the process of becoming part of God's people in Old Testament times? And how did that make a significant transition as we come into the New Testament? And so we're in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. For those of you who don't know, I've been sick for the last number of weeks. I feel like I'm on the way. You can still tell in my voice I'm fighting to get there. But I did not think I'd be able to do this. But I actually sang a little bit up here uh, for the first time in over a month. And so that was a blessing to me. It's always a joy to be here with you to worship. Um, Let's go ahead and look at this text. It is uh, just a a powerful word from God. Therefore, Ephesians 2.11, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Let's pray together. Dear God, I pray for your peace. I pray for the peace that can only come through the cross of Christ that brings various, very different people together in one spirit. God, may may we experience that today in our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our passage ends with peace. We'll end there later. There's a peace. We all need a peace with God. A peace with God that brings with it peace with others, peace with those around us, peace in church, peace in our lives, a peace about who we are and what God has called us to do and be. But we begin by looking at what things were like before Christ. Verse 11 identifies Gentiles and Jews. It says, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth. And then it talks about the uncircumcised and the circumcision, which were sort of words that were used to identify Jews and Gentiles in Roman times. And Paul says, remember you Gentiles that At that time, before you came to believe in Christ, and in the context of the passage, he's going to apply it to Gentiles before Christ came in earlier times. Remember that you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. We need to consider what was it like to be saved and how did you become part of God's people In Old Testament times, why would it be that the Gentiles were without hope and without God in the world? And what Paul is addressing is clearly there were some conflicts between Gentiles and Jews 
coming into one church together. They had very different views on all kinds of things. And so Paul wants to talk about this to show what unites them and how they can now come together. And so Paul is referring to earlier times before Christ when the people of God were centered around the nation of Israel. And what the Bible lays out for us is that there was a time when, when God had wanted the, all the people to spread out over the earth, but they rebelled against that. They refused, and they came together. And Genesis 11 talks about the Tower of Babel. They wanted to make a name for themselves, and so they all tried to unite in one place. And God confused their language, and he separated them out into 70 different nations, according to Genesis. And Deuteronomy talks about those seven nations and says it was according to the number of the sons of God which means that each of the 70 nations had a spiritual power, a spiritual ruler, a fallen angel, if you will, that was sort of allowed to rule over each of these nations. We don't look at this a lot in Scripture, but uh, Ephesians, I think, very much has this in mind because by the time we get to the end of Ephesians, Paul is going to specifically address spiritual warfare and spiritual rulers in the heavenly places. And so these 70 nations are ruled under various fallen supernatural beings and they come to know them. They are deceived and they come to identify them by the various names of pagan gods that we know about when we study ancient history. They are enslaved to them. They are deceived by them. They are led to worship the created things rather than the creator. And in that context, God begins to work out a plan of salvation where he comes to Abraham. And he says, Abraham, all of these people wanted to make a name for themselves by building a tower to heaven, but I am going to make a name for you. And though you, by the time God fulfills this promise, will be 99 years old and your wife 90 years old, unable to have children your entire lives, out of this impossible situation, I'm going to create life, I'm going to create a child and you're going to have descendants as numerous as the, descent, as the sand on the seashore, and I will create a nation, and you will be my nation. You will be my people. All the other nations have their own supernatural beings over them, but you are the nation I will create for myself. And this is part of the stage of how God brings salvation into the world. And so in those times, first of all, people were saved by faith in Christ, just like they are today. Abraham believed in the promises of God and it was credited to him as righteousness. There was not a, a separate way of salvation. In those earlier times, it was by faith in the promises that related to the coming of the Messiah. Now we are saved by placing our faith, our trust in the Messiah who has come. We know of him as Jesus Christ who was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. But it has always been by faith in Christ. What's different, because clearly when you read this text, something Dramatic happens when Christ comes. What's different is, how do you become part of the people of God? You could be saved without being an Israelite, but if you did not join the nation of Israel, you are in great danger. You are outside of a certain amount of protection. You are far from God. What, what do I mean by that? I mean that, that God set up Israel and he created boundaries for them. He created principles. He gave them laws and commands that in a sense separated them from the nations. It was necessary because out among the nations there were powerful spiritual forces of deception and if you were not inside the group of the people of Israel, you or your children would soon be caught up in the deception, in the, in the uh, all the problems and evil and danger that was in the world. And so when you read the first books of the Bible, it talks about being inside the camp versus outside the camp. Inside the camp of Israel was where the tabernacle was, where the presence of God was. And outside the camp was where danger was. It was where the lepers had to go for a time. It was where those who were unclean or had touched the dead had to go for a time. It was where the snakes were. It was where all kinds of problems were. It was where the nations and the foreign gods were. And so you wanted to stay inside the camp. And if you wanted to preserve faith in God for yourself and your family line, there was safety and nearness to the God of Israel when you were within the community of Israel. 
And therefore, if you were someone like Rahab, Rahab is a great example. You read about her in the book of Judges, and, or Joshua, I'm sorry. She lived in Jericho, and the Israelites are coming to attack Jericho. Rahab was saved. She became a believer in the promises of God as a Canaanite, as a Gentile. There were spies that came, and she hid them, and she cast her future lot with them and said, I'm going to protect you, and she asked them to save her and her household. And she, she was saved as a Gentile, but then she and her household became part of Israel. They recognized that if their family line was going to remain as part of the people of God, they had to be within the protection of Israel. And so this was how Jewish people thought. This was how Jewish people thought all the way up until New Testament times. In fact, Peter still thought this way even after the coming of Christ. In Acts chapter 10, Peter talks about this. He says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. So Peter goes to a Gentile's home. God called him to go to a Gentile's home. And he says, I'm going to enter your home, but only because God has specifically told me to. Because you know by law, Jews can't even enter into the home of a Gentile. And God, through that whole experience, tells him, hey, something has changed. And this has been the heart of God from the very beginning. God had a desire for the nations. In fact, Isaiah prophesied about this. Isaiah said, I will bring the Gentiles. God says, I will bring the Gentiles to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That means the Gentiles. In other words, God had to create a nation of his people to bring about salvation. But that salvation was always going to, at some point, when the Messiah came, extend to all the Gentiles. And Paul was one who recognized that in Christ that time had come. Something had changed. And so Paul says, yes, you Gentiles were without hope and without God in the world. You were outside of God's people and God's protection and his promises. But now, verse 13 says, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. But what is the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility? Well, the people in Ephesus reading this letter would know right away what Paul is talking about. If you were to visit the temple in Paul's day, which still stood as Paul was writing this letter, there was a court outside of the temple that was specifically designated for the Gentiles. Gentiles could come kind of close to the temple in a designated area and pray. And we even see Jesus interacting with some of the Greeks in the temple courts in the book of John. But you could only get so close. There was a dividing wall, if you will, that kept Gentiles from getting all the way to where the temple itself was. And that wall was established by several signs that were placed very clearly all around the area that marked off, hey, here's as far as Gentiles can go and no farther. And we know what, the, what that said from the writings of some historians, but we've also even found some of the stones with the inscription on them near the area where the temple once stood in Jerusalem. They, they stay in uh, two different museums that we have, and, and the writing on them uh, uh, says, warning, no foreigner is to enter. Whoever is caught will himself be responsible for his consequent death. And so if you were a Gentile, you would see these signs. Hey, go walk beyond this line, and you're responsible for your own death. It was a dividing wall of hostility. We know Paul had this in mind because he's going to go on to talk about the temple in the passage we're going to look at next week. And also, this is the very reason why Paul is in prison. Paul is writing from Rome in prison. All of the Ephesians know why Paul was arrested. Acts chapter 21 verse 29 tells us, the people in Jerusalem had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul. So what Acts tells us is that Paul went to Jerusalem. He was there with a Gentile, an Ephesian, someone who's a member of the church of Ephesus. And when they saw Paul, when the Jewish people there saw him, they assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Now Paul had not done that. He had not violated the law of the temple. But there were different Jewish leaders who assumed Paul had brought this Gentile from Ephesus 
beyond that sign. And that's what led to Paul being arrested. So all of the people of Ephesians are very familiar that this is the reason. And Paul writes here that he has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Paul says there was a time when there was a barrier necessary that would keep Gentiles away from being into the inner closest part of the presence of God. But now that barrier has been torn down. The, the literal barrier is still there. The, the legal barrier in the temple court, Paul is writing. But metaphorically speaking, the spiritual boundary that keeps Gentiles and Jews separate has been torn down by Christ's death at the cross. His purpose, Paul continues, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. It was always part of the plan of God that the gospel would go out to the nations and bring Jews and Gentiles together. It was an incredible barrier to overcome. The Jewish people had, through their laws, been trained to stay separate from the Gentiles. There's spiritual danger. There's deception. There's deceit. There's darkness. And so there were all kinds of laws that they had that were based on laws in the Old Testament, but then developed further to say, uh, if you are going to be clean in order to enter the temple, in order to worship, you cannot have contact with you cannot be contaminated with by various things. And the Gentiles ignore all those rules. And so even going into a Gentile home would contaminate you certainly. And so you would separate yourself even from entering the home of a Gentile. But God's promise had always been, and Jesus said at the end of his ministry, the gospel is going to go out to all nations. And God is going to bring even those who are far off together with those who are near. And there's going to be peace with them. I want you to picture yourselves in this church in Ephesus. You have Jews coming in. You have Gentiles coming in. We in our culture, in our context, can't imagine how great that divide was. But it was a sharp, all kinds of cultural barriers divide. How are we going to come and sit together in one place and worship the God of Israel as Jews and Gentiles together. And Paul says, it is through the cross of Christ. It is through salvation. It is through one spirit that is in both, how God is bringing them together. And so whatever your differences, whatever your struggles are, there is one salvation that unites you. And this message is the same message that should echo down to us today. First of all, let me, let me say a few things about church itself. Church is very unpopular in our culture today. Most people have the perception that if I want to be a Christian and follow God and believe in Christ, I can kind of just do that on my own. I don't need to attend church. I don't need to do the church thing. My spiritual beliefs are just kind of between me and God. That's, that's where so many people in our culture are at. And I would just say the word of God says that we need to be around other people who are believers in the God of Israel. There needed to be a people of God in Old Testament times that could protect and shield and remind us of the truths of God's word and enable the Israelites to encourage one another and stay together and hear God's word together. And in our time, we are designed, we are made not to go it alone. We are designed and made and a part of our salvation is that the fact that we have one spirit that unites us. We need to worship together. We need to study the Bible. We need to hear preaching together. We need to pray for one another. We need each other if we're going to be protected from the spiritual forces of darkness and deception that are still very much part of our world and culture. If you want to stay faithful to God, if you want your faith to grow, if you want to pass it on to your children and to your grandchildren, then you need the protection that comes from the different elements that, that God has put into the local church that he designed in the New Testament. We're going to look more at that next week. I also want to uh, just share a little bit about how this message about how God has brought even Jew and Gentile together into one church should speak to us about peace in our lives, peace in, in our church, peace uh, in all kinds of areas that we might disagree with, but we have one salvation that brings us together. So let me begin by talking a little bit about the election. And everyone is just 
stressing out so much. I see different news stories about how people's stress levels are like at all times high because of the election. So even as I say the word election, some of you are just kind of sitting up a little bit more like, what is he going to say about the election? So a couple things uh, I, I, I want to uh, just let you know. First of all, um, whatever happens in the election, despite the fact that people on both sides of the campaigns are making it seem like the apocalypse is upon us, no matter you know, if the other side wins. Uh, God will still be God. Uh, God's plans will still be in place. Uh, our salvation is secure in Christ. Uh, what ultimately God wants to do to bring the world to a place uh, of peace and salvation and glory and closeness to him will still be in place. So we of all people should have peace in our hearts in the time of the election. Uh, the second thing I'll just share with you is uh, I, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for today. I know I, I would assume that if you haven't already voted, you've probably made up your mind who you're going to vote for. Uh, I do believe over time in preaching the principles about what government is about, why government is made, or why God has established government, what we as Christians are to think through those things. But I heard someone say this week that if you have differences over politics and who you're voting for, don't let it ruin lifelong important friendships. Don't let it ruin important family relationships. Uh, there, there are things that are more important than who you're voting for. Uh, and, and I'll just say today that that should extend to the church family. I, I think most of us are kind of in alignment in our basic political beliefs, but there are some who aren't. Uh, there are outliers. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, loudly proclaim who I'm voting for and from the pulpit, but I don't hide it. It's not a secret. You can ask me if you want. But I, I, I would just say that even this sharp political divide that we're in in our country right now, we need to keep in mind, by the way, the person who said, don't let politics ruin your family relationships and uh, your important friendships, that was someone on one of the tickets. That was J.D. Vance that said that uh, earlier uh, this week. And, and, and I think that should apply to uh, our, our church family in that all of us have different information and both campaigns are trying to say the other side is lying about everything. And so if you haven't been paying attention for a long time, it's very hard to discern who's telling the truth. Just because someone is voting a different way than you, they may not know the things you know. They may not have paid attention the way you did. They may um, be coming at it from a different angle than you did. And as important as it is, and voting biblically and voting to honor God is very important it shouldn't divide us to the point where we can't still recognize that, that we may have the same spirit, that we may be saved, that we may be part of the same Christian family. And, and I'm talking about something that is about as divisive as we can get in our culture today. But I believe that the arguments that the Gentiles and Jews, the tensions they had, the cultural differences they had when they were in one church together, they were even greater than that, by far. And that's the kind of thing that Paul is saying. He's saying even Gentiles and Jews can be brought together by Jesus Christ and by his salvation. And so how much more should all the other kind of things we disagree about or maybe have different views or different preferences or different, different ideas about how to do church or what song to pick or what you know, kind of decorations we want and everything else, we have to keep in mind at the bottom that God can bring incredibly different people together under the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as, as we think about uh, elections, you know, a lot of people are talking about the last uh, four years and, uh, you know, what's changed, what's better, what's worse. Uh, and, and, and as I was thinking about that today, I just want to just say a few things to encourage us as a, a church. Um, there's so many things that God is doing in our church and so many things that, that should cause us to uh, love our church, find joy in our church, want to be committed to our church. Um, in the last year or so, we have seen we're steadily building up uh, our worship team. We have some new people uh, coming into our, our praise team up here uh, regularly. We have a couple new people coming in uh, this month. Uh, and uh, it's just exciting to see God take some talented people, connect them to our church. And we've been building up that, that praise team each week. And it's been a joy for me to be a part of that. Over the last several years, we've been building up our children's program. Three years ago, we had Sundays where my two kids were the only kids in, in the kids' program, different weeks. Uh, we had Wednesday nights where no one came, and we 
began to sit down and look at what kind of program can we get, what kind of leaders do we need, what kind of way do we need to promote this, and um, we began looking at Awana. Uh, I began talking with uh, Jess, um, Jess Meyerskoff, and we began to look at what, do we, what kind of facilities do we need, what kind of leaders do we need to talk to about how we can do this, and, and we now have, uh, it's just such a joy to see uh, a blessing for our adult teachers and workers as well as for our children to see disciples making disciples, seeing those kids learn those verses, seeing um, our adults being involved in that process is just such a blessing to see that um, build into our Sunday kids program is a blessing. Our youth program has had various ups and downs the last few years. And uh, starting last spring, uh, Pastor Paul and I, we were looking at, you know, what is it that we need to change What's getting in the way? Why do we grow and then kind of fall back and grow and fall back? And well, we knew there's just a facility issue. There's just a, a, a number of issues like that to really build the kind of program they need. And so we worked hard over the summer. Pastor Paul especially is working hard to put some things in place and uh, do a lot of things over the summer so that um, we could really have a, a, a growth and a, a some, see something great. And uh, we got a bunch of youth down here in the front of the church uh, coming to church Sunday morning. We've seen that really take off Friday nights. It's been a real big blessing to see uh, all of that happen. We've um, financially, I'll just say, God continues to bless us. We've celebrated the roof fund uh, just a little while ago that, that we've met that. Uh, we were way in the after COVID, uh, and uh, we came back to where we balanced our budget the next year. Uh, we were well in the black uh, last year, about $20,000 in the black. And this year, we're on pace to run a balanced budget, even with a $93,000 uh, roof expense that we had to cover. So every year, yeah. Every year since COVID, we've been uh, you know, building uh, financially. We're in, in, in better shape. And so that's very encouraging. Our women's ministry is just taken off like crazy. And that has just been a blessing to see. Uh, we are, yes, uh, that is exciting. And we are now starting to just kind of think through. It's that phase where you just got to kind of think through, what do we need to do to get a men's ministry kind of off and going? So we're, we're thinking through uh, those things right now. Um, uh, I want to uh, share with you also that, that a lot of what we've done, we've talked about how do we become a welcoming church that reaches out to the community and that reaches the lost with the gospel. And so a lot of the things like Awana and kids program and youth and everything, is we're putting those pieces together because we want to get the gospel out. And over the last two years, we have had 20 baptisms in our church, which... which I'm excited about all 20 of those baptisms we've been a part of. I think we can grow that more. I think that's a start, but it is more over a two-year period than we've had in over 20 years in our church, and so uh, I think that shows that we're heading in the right direction. And so um, these are all um, things that it's in a time, honestly, when uh, I've heard about multiple churches just in the last two months that are in our area that are churches that were about our size or even bigger that are shutting their doors. COVID has been hard on so many churches. Uh, some of the really big churches in the area are still doing well, but churches like ours have, have been struggling. And uh, I, I just want us to understand, first of all, that there's power in the church. Christ brings people from different countries, different languages, different cultures, different church backgrounds, different beliefs even, and he puts us all together and we're united under our faith in Jesus Christ and the salvation he brings. And um, we want to be dedicated to this thing called the church. It's where we're protected, where we can grow, uh, where we are protected even from the lies of the world, where we can grow closer to God, where we can come near to the presence of God. Uh, and, and so we want as a people to be committed to seeing God do great things uh, in, in our church. And um, as we prepare for a time of invitation, I, I just want us to ask, about, ask you about trusting in Jesus. I believe the church is so helpful in bringing us back to that again and again. It is truly so sweet to trust in him, to believe in him, to have faith in him. And this morning I want to ask you, do you trust in Jesus? Do you trust in Jesus for salvation? That's the first and most important thing, but do you trust in Jesus in the situations and difficulties and challenges in your life right now? And this morning I invite you to 
to just come and whatever your burdens are, lay them before Christ. You can do that where you're seated. You can come pray. I'd be happy to pray with you here at the front. There's a connect card in the pew in front of you if God's leading you to seek prayer for anything, to seek change in your life about anything, you can put something down on that card, turn it in, I'll pray over that, reach out to you later. This is our time to simply be thankful to God for his presence here and to remember that it's all about trusting in him. Let's stand together as we sing. I'm so glad I learned to Trust in precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, will be with me too. circumstances and all things. We give you all the praise and the glory this morning. It is so sweet to trust in you, God. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're so glad you came today. Uh, I'll be out in front after the service. Love to talk with you, pray with you there. Um, but have a great week. We